a genre of horrific and awe-inspiring suggestion had been conceived in the early 20th century, spawning tales of the intangible, unstoppable, unspeakable, and the unknown. Cosmic Horror, a multi-dimensional structure of creativity and versatility, makes cosmic horror one of the few genres which encourages genuinely unconventional thought and abstraction to be woven into a tightly knit, albeit difficult, form where, with ample originality, truly unique stories may be written. In light of the widespread intrigue in the genre, like with anything else, dilution and lumping has become rather commonplace, specifically with regard to Lovecraftian horror. That isn't to say that Lovecraft's interpretation is of poor quality, quite the opposite really. Regardless, it is worth clarifying one such mislabeling. There is far more than Lovecraft's work which aligns the foundation of the genre. Much like the tortoise and turtle comparison, all Lovecraftian horror is cosmic horror, but not all cosmic horror is Lovecraftian horror. Cosmic horror is far more than incomprehensible beings who would perceive our species as a singular speck of dust in an empty blackness, assuming they paid us any mind in the first place. It comes in many forms, a perceptually endless expanse, the uncertainty of existence, the passage of time, a certain strangeness, spoken by no one but lingering in the air, and the almighty power of nature herself, among other innumerable themes. The sheer potential for originality and versatility is unmatched by any other genre beyond the parent weird fiction. Whilst Lovecraft is rightfully credited for the creation of his own branch stemming from the main tree, he had not planted the initial sapling. According to a letter sent by Lovecraft to one Lee Baldwin on February 13th, 1934, I first tried writing at six, and the earliest story I can remember was written at seven, something about a cave of robbers called the Noble Eavesdropper. The story had never seen the light of day, and presumably had nothing to do with cosmic horror anyway. In spite of this, the works of several other prolific authors predate Lovecraft's exploration of the genre entirely. The House on the Borderland by William Hope Hodson, The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers, though this can be taken with a grain of salt, as the cosmic linkage is possibly due to Derelith's interpretation and later inclusion of Haster in the Cthulhu mythos as Cthulhu's stepbrother. Which, by the way, the idea of a Cthulhu mythos completely undermines the intentions behind Lovecraft's work. Additional stories authored by Derelith, the man who created the mythos in the first place, took on a bland, good versus evil structure and incorporated a pantheon and an elemental system, effectively humanizing these indifferent alien beings, but that's a whole topic for another day. Before Lovecraft and Hodson, and many others for that matter, comes one Algernon Blackwood, the highly regarded author behind numerous influential tales. The Willows, the Wendigo, the Centaur, the Empty House, and many other stories of supernatural and sublime fiction interlaced with elements of cosmicism, mysticism, and metaphysical beliefs. Algernon Blackwood was one of, if not, the very first true cosmic horror author. Before we explore the art, let's familiarize ourselves with the artist, shall we? Born into a zealous family in Shooter's Hill during the spring of 1869, Blackwood had been raised under the hand of Calvinism, a Protestant branch of Christianity in a comfortable upper-middle-class home. His mother and father, a widowed duchess and a high-ranking post officer respectively, injected their spirituality into their son's life since birth, as expected at the time. They later sent him off to be educated 
by the Moravian Brotherhood in rural Germany, the Black Forest specifically. He was later sent to Wellington College and Edinburgh University. A life of forced piety, coupled with narrow-minded upbringings, was cause for Blackwood to explore the stunted aspects of his imagination. In his teen years, Blackwood exposed himself to a Germanic branch of animism, the belief that everything, inanimate or not, possesses a spirit, a collective consciousness. Once returned to the UK, Blackwood had begun to explore his immutable interest in the esoteric and occult, as well as both the natural and supernatural worlds. His studies spanned various Eastern philosophies and religions, hypnotism, mysticism, esoteric theology, and metaphysical practices, namely psychokinesis and clairvoyance, not to be confused with telekinesis. Despite his interest in all facets of the esoteric, Blackwood never clung to one singular ideology or group. Subscribing to the principle of open-minded exploration of oneself and the universe through both a scientific and spiritual lens. Between his studies, Blackwood was an avid biophile. Dense woodland, flowing river, or Swiss Alp, he was at home with the environment regardless of location. All the while, modern civilization repulsed him like the fetid stench of a bloated corpse rolling in the river. An article titled Down the Danube in a Canadian Canoe, published in Macmillan's Magazine in 1901, highlights one of Blackwood's many ventures. Blackwood recalls, vividly, his experience traveling said river in said boat in a concise string of paragraphs, an experience of which that later influenced one of the most important pieces of weird fiction and cosmic horror ever written. The mountains became higher, the valley narrower, limestone cliffs scooped and furrowed by the eddies of a far larger Danube thousands of years before, rose gleaming out of the pine woods about their base. One moment we were in blazing sunlight, the next in deep shadow under the cliffs. When we went to bed at ten o'clock, the full moon shone upon the white cliffs with a dazzling brilliance that seemed to turn them into ice, while the deep shadows over the river made the scene strangely impressive. Only the tumbling of water and the chirping of the crickets broke the silence. In the night, we woke and thought we had heard people moving around the tent, but on going out to sea, the canoe was still safe and the white moonshine revealed no figures. It was doubtless the river talking in its sleep, or the wind wandering lost among the bushes. Big grey hawks circled overhead, and grey crows by the thousands lined the shores. That evening, we found a sheltered camp on a sandy island, where pollards and willows roared in the wind. As if to show the loneliness of the spot, an otter, rolling over and over among the eddies, swam past us as we landed. About sunset, the clouds broke up momentarily and let out a flood of crimson light all over the wild country. Against the gorgeous red sky, a stream of dark clouds, in all shapes and kinds, hurried over the Carpathian Mountains. What gives scenes like this their ambience of otherworldliness is not that they are menacing monsters in the night, but rather that the entire environment is somehow alive. <laughs> Having spent much of his life under the oppressive thumb of organized religion, he sought to experience true life in his early adulthood. Traveling overseas, Blackwood dropped anchor and aimed to make a life for himself in Canada. He fell in love with the country, its people, landscapes, and folklore. 
He spent his days working as a farmer, businessman, and hotel worker, while traveling the country within the limits of his capital. Life, however, cannot be fed with crumbs. Due to Blackwood's shriveling income and assets, he crossed the border into New York, supporting himself, barely, with meager work from a variety of positions. Bartender, secretary, a violin teacher at one point, a journalist for the New York Times, among many, many other occupations. Unlike the comparatively minute Canadian communities of the North, Blackwood found far more individuals utterly intolerable. He had found that many shared an indifferent perspective towards nature, with little in the way of general openness. Despite such annoyances, Blackwood made the most of his stay until, eventually, his poor paying work could no longer support him, driving him back to England by his thirties. With this grand library of experience at his disposal, Blackwood possessed a multitudinous source of inspiration for what was at the time his hobby, writing. Traveling quenched his thirst for nature, if only momentarily, but a part of him remained comparatively malnourished. His insatiable hunger for the occult and supernatural. Taking to pen and paper, Blackwood began writing. Within two years of returning home, one of his stories, a case of eavesdropping, received publication due to one of his friends leaking the art to a magazine, Pall Mall Magazine to be specific. Six years later, A Haunted Island and The Empty House and Other Ghost Stories received the same treatment without any friendly intervention this time. These publications quickly brought Blackwood substantial success in the literary world, encouraging him to focus ever more on his writing. Speaking of Blackwood's fiction, our literary analysis of The Willows begins here. In the description, comments, cards, and in the credits, pastebin, links to both a digital library of Blackwood's work, as well as a reading voiced and produced by the talented Ian Gordon of Horror Babble. Enjoy at your leisure. The narrator and his Swedish companion, who emulates Blackwood himself, travel down the Danube. On either side of the channel, Swampland stretches on for miles, populated by an endless army of willows, who, apart from swaying in the wind, will be consumed during the coming flood, as will the surrounding environment. Battered by unceasing wind, the travelers sought a suitable campsite, away from nature's wrath, or at least somewhere comparatively mild. Having located an island in the Danube, one which is gradually eroding at the behest of nature. The two men dragged their canoe across the sand, settling in their campsite under the hot sun, surrounded by hordes of waving willows and water that will render the island uninhabitable in the coming days. Despite the density of the willows, the duo wander the island at least the few areas which were not impossibly crowded by countless willows. At some point on the riverbank, the Swede cries out, claiming to have found the body of a man. Thankfully, with the narrator's rational perspective, he states it to be an otter hunting for food, rolling about the eddies before diving away. Later, during nightfall, a curious boat, one which did not belong on the Danube, especially during flood season, sailed at alarming speeds. The light on board, obscured by the coxswain, who, according to the narrator, made the sign of the cross. Just as soon as he came, he disappeared down the Danube, vanishing in the darkened stretch of willows. The two men, unsettled by this peculiar encounter, the narrator theorizing the coxswain's intent, the Swede half-jokingly playing off of superstition, uncertainty in his voice. They return to the camp, 
the narrator criticizing the Swede for his unimaginative behavior. The narrator concludes that there must be something else here. Something in the air is... off. A stark contrast to the natural awe of this place. What exactly it is, the narrator is not certain. As their fire burns away more of their wood, the narrator searches for more driftwood. At the edge of the island, lost in disquiet thought, convinced that they must have disturbed a dormant presence of some kind. Turning back to return to camp, the Swede stands near, his initial approach masked by the elements. Throughout the first chapter, Blackwood often personifies nature, implying that, beyond fauna, everything from the wind to the foliage is thinking, moving, and alive. This, as you know, falls in line with Blackwood's beliefs in animism. Nature is more than just a backdrop. It is a character, a personage. Not only in the Willows, but in many of Blackwood's work. This character, nature, is omnipresent and omnipotent. The howling wind and the audience of foliage, ears and eyes, while the gargantuan river tears apart the landmass that the travelers have taken refuge on. But even this power, as immeasurable as it may be, can coexist with the two men. To fight nature is futile. Beginning where the narrator left off, reunited with the Swede, the Swede claims that his companion has been gone for quite some time. Over the howling wind, and between each word, a certain look on his face, as well as a shift in his tone, insinuated that something had occurred in the narrator's absence. The intense wind lent itself to support the idea of impending disaster, something which both the men had underlying concern for. In lieu of these outlying oddities, they returned to their tent and packed in for the night. The canoe had been turned over beside the tent, with the two paddles stowed beneath it, while the remainder of the supplies were stored above ground, hanging from branches. Deeper into the night, during the midnight hour, the narrator awoke with few hours of rest. The Swede continued sleeping in the wash of moonlight, the wind howling as it had done before, yet something was out of place. Not inside nor immediately outside the tent, rather somewhere relatively nearby, but distant enough not to be a threat. Crawling from his shelter, under the cover of branches violently swaying, the narrator espied the trance-like movements cast above the canopy on the other side of the water. He sat and observed, inordinate and rapidly shifting figures, not quite human, ascended from earth to sky. Denying his first instinct to wake another set of eyes, he watched in awe, with exhausted vision. Their bronze-colored figure, immense size, and clearly independent movement of the swaying willows entered the celestial spotlight. They rose from behind the foliage, vanishing in the blackness of the sky, their forms interlacing with one another, creating a great column which did not belong in our world. Their huge bodies and limbs melted in and out of each other, forming a serpentine line that bent and swayed and twisted with the contortions of the molested trees. The narrator could never sight their faces if they had any, for that matter, as they continuously poured upward. He strained himself to watch as closely as possible, attempting to make sense of it all. Nary a thing indicated that what was occurring was anything short of real and tangible. Although he remained somewhat skeptical, left in disbelief by the otherworldly sight, the standard for reality had changed in the presence of these ethereal, awe-striking beings. As far as he was concerned, he had been witness to the personification of the elements of this ancient region of Earth, 
had given reason for powers beyond to emerge. Feeling a compulsion to move closer, a harsh wind toppled the narrator, breaking his trance. In this new, attentive state, he made effort once more to convince himself that what he was witnessing was merely subjective, a hallucination. Following further attempts at rationality, the figures disappeared when his attention was brought back to the scene. It was as though they were never there to begin with, or, at the very least, their presence was intentionally temporary, a beacon of sorts. The narrator returns to the tent and hides away from the violent wind, still attentive when woken once more by something else. An approaching multitudinous pattering, a dissonance which he claims to have been aware of for quite some time, becoming audible whilst he slept. He felt a shivering cold. Breathing became something of a challenge. Something was pressing steadily against the sides of the tent and weighed down on it from above. He theorized dozens of potential answers skimming through them in rapid succession, settling on the terrifying conclusion that a poplar tree had fallen in the wind, caught by other branches, and was soon to crush the travelers. Calling for the Swede to follow in the mad dash from the tent, he bore witness to nothing. No rain, no sand, no tree. Nothing had touched the tent, pattering nor weighted force. The Swede remained still, undisturbed by the frantic words of his companion. Assessing his surroundings, the narrator noted that all remained constant. The canoe and its paddles, the supplies and an extra lantern hanging from a tree, and the endless army of willows shaking their fists in the wind. Before returning to bed, the narrator crossed to the farther shoreline. The glow of dawn began to cast over the troubled skies of night. On the way back to the tent, he purposefully passed beneath the same locale which the figures rose from earlier that night. Abruptly, he is struck with the unmatched terror as a large figure shrouded in shadow hurried by in the brush. Something passed him, he was certain. In his brief trek, he came to another horrifying realization. The landscape had changed. Not only had the island, as predicted and expected, begun to shrink, but the willows themselves. They encroached on their territory. They had clearly drawn closer in the night. He marked their place with a line in the sand, assuring himself that this was but another hallucination. Though, once again, he did not entirely believe himself. He returned to camp and slept with no more interruption. When he awoke proper, the sun was high above and the Swede was cooking breakfast on the fire. The narrator asks if there is any wood left, to which the Swede curiously replies, stating that there is indeed enough to last till tomorrow. A change of heart. Not only that, but his behavior became worthy of suspicion. Something had frightened the Swede. While eating breakfast, the Swede vigorously studied the map and took a moment to smoke from his pipe, the first time he had done so during their entire journey. Between the two men, words are shared. Following their brief discourse, the Swede states that the steering paddle is gone and the canoe had sustained damage overnight. The narrator attempts to rationalize both the missing paddle and the damage. Even still, he does not feel convinced by his thinly veiled theories. As for the other paddle, it had somehow been scraped down as though sanded to the point where it would snap after the first stroke. In light of these troubling occurrences which would have occurred sometime this morning, the narrator checks the perimeter line. All is the same as the night before. The willows did not advance further. There was, instead, basin-shaped craters of varying size imprinted in sand, ranging from the size of a small teacup to a large bowl. Once more, 
feeble rationality takes hold, claiming the wind to be responsible. The pair worked on the damaged boat, distracting themselves from the shared underlying concern and internalized terror. The Swede did not notice the narrator's expression, which would give way to his utter lack of composure. His imagination was no longer a viable scapegoat for which conclusions may stem from. As day breaks and the two men, at odds with both themselves and one another, emerge from their tent, the air stood still. The wind had died down, but a new strangeness, a dissonance, became apparent, its position and intensity ever-changing and irregular followed the men at varying distances everywhere they went. Continuous self-doubt is displayed by the overly rational narrator, while the continued strange behavior of the Swede indicated that he had bore witness to something, consciously or not, which has affected him so much so that he expresses his otherworldly spiritual connections that he has had since he was a child. Their walls are not crumbling, they are under siege by an invisible force. These gods, as the Swede referred to them as, are not gods of the conventional sort. They are not gods at all, for that matter. They are, instead, beings of another plane, a region beyond our own that is outside of our personal agency. This part of the Danube just so happens to be where our world and their own intersects in some unknowable way. After much conversation and disconcerting mental developments, the Swede suggests that the beings know of their presence, but not of their location. They have found them through thought alone. The men aim to wait out the night and slip away undetected by emptying their minds of all thought. The borders of black and white are beginning to overlap into a near endless moat of grey, trapping the men in this precarious predicament. As an aside, although there is less to examine in this chapter, the general happenings pertain to mental depreciation and the waning trust between one another. Both men are gradually becoming unstable and subjectively irrational as their understanding of the situation becomes simultaneously lucid and obscured. The presence no longer hides, though it never truly hid to begin with. Much like before, concerns continue to be validated by the devolving conditions. The island is being consumed, eroded, by the Danube, and something seems to be tracking the men. The narrator's over-reliance on perceived rationality has proven to be more of a hindrance than anything else. In response, the Swede has taken charge of seemingly all critical thought. The narrator sails past the precipice, crumbling beneath his own failing faculties as the potential of a gruesome end becomes not only possible, but likely. Following this disturbance, the humming sound zeroes in on their location causing the men to dash into the bush, away from their compromised campsite. But before they can make much distance at all, a strange silhouette is sighted, back the way they came. In close proximity to the tent, it was neither animal nor man, comparatively enormous to either of themselves. It moved irregularly, in front of the fire. The men had seen it, and now they thought of it, luring it to their location. The men tumbled over each other, the Swede briefly falling unconscious, and the narrator in sharp pain, both of which have taken their minds off of this logic-defying creature, rendering themselves invisible and evading their would-be demise. Returning to their feet, they laugh off their near-death experience, terror underlying their chuckles. The humming of the ethereal hunting party is at last gone. The air is still and the creature is nowhere to be seen. But around the campsite, in the sand, 
basin-shaped hollows once more. These, however, were much, much larger. A whole foot and leg could fit in some of the depressions, far outclassing that which stalked their camp previously. Laced in terror which they dare not think of, they doze off in exhaustion. The narrator wakes during the night, the atmosphere oppressive and air heavy. Something pressed against him. He received no reply from his companion. The tent flaps were curiously left open. Realizing that he was alone and surrounded by the same light pattering as before, he rushed from the tent in search of his friend. Bursting onto the shore, the narrator spotted and subdued the Swede. He was willing, or perhaps forcibly altered, to give himself to the Willows as a sacrifice. Dragging him back to safety, he abruptly fell asleep at the end of his fit. Upon waking, the Swede behaved somewhat normally, unaware of his irrational outburst through the night. The humming was gone, the intrusive thoughts had subsided, but the memories lingered. Everything was all too real. The Willows received their sacrifice. It was the corpse of a man, turning over in the water. He must have been there for but a few hours, in line with when the Swede's fit came to an end. Out of respect, considering the hell they had been through, the Swede suggests a proper burial, but upon touching the body, several simultaneous humming sounds emit from the surface of the corpse until it had been pulled down further into the Danube. Both men dropped to their knees as the corpse turned over and over to show a bare chest indented with the same small hollows, exactly the same as those found all over the island. It turned over and over on the eddies, like a hunting otter. Throughout the entirety of the Willows, we are treated to a plethora of naturalistic scenery interwoven with otherworldly images and beings who, at times, are far more awe-striking than they are maddening. Unlike the works of Lovecraft, Blackwood did not superimpose madness on the extraordinary. We see this most plainly when the narrator emerges from the tent in the dead of night drawn from thinly veiled safety to gorge on an impossible spectacle. A certain mystique comes from the inability to see the faces of the floating figures and their general lack of hostility. Like the blowing wind, it is indifferent to us, carrying on with or without our intervention. Conversely, a force one akin to the storm the two men endured, attempts to flush them out of the land by any means, physical or mental, degrading mental cohesion and very real threats of unreal origin. However, like a natural disaster, we know that there is at least one root cause. An avalanche can be caused by an echoing voice, an earthquake tectonic plates suddenly breaking or shifting along a fault line, and my personal favorite, the impossibly large structure and unique conditions which birth a tornado, a literal child when compared to the parent system. The difference between the creatures in the willows and natural disasters is that the beings possess agency, they are thinking. Beyond the physical, we are treated to the two men the narrator, and the Swede. Both in their own unique ways, gradually they descend into delirium. The narrator becomes irritable as the standards of reality change and his companion shows to be more aware of the implications. The Swede, initially presented by the narrator as a dolt, gradually reveals to both the narrator and the reader that the idea of the fantastical is not so fantastical and far-fetched, after all. Another plane exists beyond our own, and instead of denying this reality, the Swede attempts to make sense of it, in a way which goes against the narrator's blunted black and white perspective. In doing so, it appears that the present sees the malleability and takes advantage of it, 
Or perhaps the Swede learns far more than he should. Speaking of this presence, from the moment the men arrived on the island, something clearly didn't want them there. A sense of unease can be felt through the entire story, from the elements eating away at the island to the forces beyond playing their hand. It is made apparent that we are not welcome here. As stated in the beginning, cosmic horror is so widely varied that there is room for all sorts of cosmic forces. Nature is one which we are familiar with, and frankly, take for granted. In the case of Blackwood's fiction, nature calls on for the assistance of her supernatural relatives. There are more intricacies regarding both cosmic horror and Blackwood's art that go far beyond the scope of a simple analysis of a single story. For the sake of brevity, we shall move on. But if you feel so inclined to further educate yourself on the topic, as I encourage you to do so regardless, I recommend digging through the works of one Avatar of Chaos, Ava for short. Some of their exploratory works have been used during my research. Links are provided below both comments and description. For those unfamiliar with their work, Ava is a cosmic horror expert, specialized in reviewing cosmic horror games, but his knowledge greatly exceeds that of interactive art and rivals most others interested in the genre. The occasional essays which, for instance, explore the broader topic of cosmic horror classification are amongst the most digestible and thorough examinations of the genre available online. Now, where were we? The Willows was one of the many stories written within the earliest part of Blackwood's career. Following its success and the success of other earlier stories, he continued writing short stories, novellas, and novels, many of which saw great success. His focus on human insignificance when compared to that of nature remained prevalent throughout, as did his disdain for modern civilization. As Blackwood's years reached finality, the man had been hosted on various radio stations, television channels, and was even filmed at one point to read aloud his stories, until, tragically, his life had been cut short by a series of strokes. With the loss of this influential and extraordinary man, his presence, much like his stories, continues to echo throughout the works of innumerable artists spanning all walks of life. With his departure, Blackwood left behind a message of sorts for aspiring and established writers within the genre. Cosmic horror cannot be effective without an equal or greater level of insurmountable awe. Whether it be the impossible size of an infinitely complex being, the alien visage of something beyond our understanding, the endless extent of a strange presence, or anything in between, cosmic horror requires the beauty of the unknown in order to induce fear, and at times, that beauty is meant to outweigh fear tenfold. Thank you for your time and support. No matter how brief, I hope to see you again. Have a pleasant day.